Welcome back to another edition of the Friday Golf Podcast. I am your host, Andy Johnson. Uh, today, we've got an exciting podcast. I, I'm glad with how this turned out. We did two different interviews. We talked with Gabby Herzig, who wrote an article about how the U.S. presidential election could shape the future of PGA Tour golf and the PIF deal. Uh, that piece appeared in The Athletic, uh, where she writes, also appeared on the New York Times website. Uh, really, uh, I, I thought it was a cool story, unique story, um, especially with the election around the corner. So we talked with Gabby. Um, she's a staff writer at The Athletic uh, for a bit. And then we transition over to Brentley Romine from the Golf Channel to talk about college golf. Really, this this conversation centered around what's going on with NIL, what's potentially coming down the road with the revenue sharing with NCAAs, um, and really you know, this arms race that is college golf, the money in college golf, and how college golf has changed over the last few years. So that was a uh, super fun conversation as well. So before we get to Gabby and Brentley, let's talk a little bit about our partner, Stripe. Um, I am extremely excited to partner with Stripe. I love partnering with people that we use their products. And Stripe has been a partner of the fried egg and this podcast for seven years, uh, really since we started taking payments on on fried egg. And one of the cool things I can say, I can't you can't say this about every partner. We've never had one issue with Stripe. Never had it be down, like had bad downtime. We've never wondered how we were getting our money because Stripe is a super great product. Um, and because of that, it powers one percent of the total GDP. So they help partners like us, a small growing business. And they also help giant companies like Hertz, Marriott, um, the PGA, Salesforce, Squarespace, Toyota, WordPress. Um, so massive companies, small companies, they uh, have your back and have products that you can use. Uh, we use it generally for the, the checkout function, which is great because they uh, accept like a huge range of payment options. And that helps people check out more often uh, when they can use their payment uh, method. They also have a billing uh, product which allows you to allows you to use like basically any type of business model you have, whether you need monthly subscriptions or usage based billing. Um, it can handle that. So, if you're interested in partnering with Stripe or learning more about it, check out Stripe.com. That's S T R I P E. Dot com, just like Stripe in a tee shot. All right, let's get to Gabby Herzig and uh, talk about her piece about the election and uh, pro golf. All right, we, we're going to bring on Gabby Herzig uh, from The Athletic. She's a staff writer there. Also, her work regularly appears on the New York Times uh, homepage in New York Times print. I saw you had a piece earlier this year in the in the in the newspaper that had to be really cool. Um, you recently wrote a story uh, last week about the election and how it could impact pro golf, men's pro golf in particular. I found it fascinating. It was something that I hadn't really thought of, but makes a ton of sense. Um, I guess like to start this conversation, um, where are we at right now with the Saudi deal? And and obviously, the that's been kind of the topic of golf for the last year and a half and the Department of Justice. Yeah. First of all, thanks guys for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. Excited to talk about this. And the truth is, we we don't really know anything, you know, more than we did eight months ago. I would say. Um, I feel like the inspiration for this story in particular was hearing players and executives kind of bring up the DOJ as something that is in the conversation right now. And I thought to myself, well, they keep mentioning the DOJ and there are these conversations of roadblocks, but what does this all really mean? What could be happening behind the scenes? So I kind of sought out legal experts, law professors, um, attorneys, former DOJ employees even, and just tried to kind of figure out what this process even looks like. Um, and kind of in doing that, I 
kept hearing the election pop up and the possibility that the Department of Justice could act very differently under a different administration. So that was kind of the whole inspiration for going down this rabbit hole. Um, but truthfully, we we don't know anything new. We know that the negotiations are happening behind closed doors. Jay Monahan made that very clear at um, his most recent press conference at Eastlake, at the Tour Championship. Um, we've heard you know comments from Rory pop up here and there, or other PGA Tour board members that they're optimistic that a deal is going to happen, but it just takes time. So all that is to say, I don't have any inside information or exclusive info for you guys, but um, it is interesting to learn a little bit more about what could be next for the PGA Tour and for PIF deal. Yeah, I in in the DOJ, uh, I, how can you explain just for people that might not know um, how does that work with the president? What you know is the DOJ? It, it's not a separate entity. It really works more with the executive branch of, of the government, correct? Right, right. That's that's something I feel like that honestly just hasn't been occurring to people in this discussion of, of the DOJ. And, um, you know, it is it's part of the executive branch of the government and a president can appoint the attorney general, the Depart- Department of Justice. Um, and also in, in antitrust, specifically the FTC, um, the Federal Trade Commission also investigates mergers and deals of this nature, but it just depends on what industry it is. So in this case, and as reported by the Wall Street Journal originally, the Department of Justice is the one, the body um, investigating this deal specifically. And yeah, it, it, there's, you know, the term is prosecutorial discretion. So the DOJ can exercise what it wants to pursue. It can choose, you know, which deals it wants to investigate. And there's nothing in law or written. And also, by the way, I'm not an expert on this at all. I just have been reading and talking to people about this for three weeks. But um, there's no nothing written in law that says the DOJ has to investigate a deal if it passes a, a thir- certain threshold or whatever it might be. It in that article, I talk about the Hart Scott Rodino Act, which um, triggers a review of the deal. But there's no exclusive verbiage around um, if a deal has to be challenged. That's up to the Department of Justice and its staff. You know, you haven't brought any rumors or or uh, intel, but you know, I've heard um, from a few people uh, that are knowledgeable of of the deal that the DOJ is absolutely a factor right Mm -hmm. now with the deal. And the idea of golf coming together right now is not really even being discussed. Like a joint schedule is not being discussed because of the influence of the DOJ. Um, I think your piece did a really great job of kind of explaining uh, an example of of why the DOJ is mm. interested in pro golf. Um, obviously, a unification of of the game is great for consumers. But what about the unification of the game? Does the DOJ not like from a kind of antitrust case? Yeah, I use this one example of um, another deal that was actually shut down by the DOJ. It was the Penguin Random House merger um, with Simon and Schuster and. Biden's DOJ blocked that from happening because in, you know, very layman's terms, basically before the merger, there were two different bodies um, competing for the labor of authors and writers and, and book deals. And if they were to come together, basically there wouldn't be as many opportunities for those authors and they could control the market a lot more. And that's kind of a, at a low level sense of uh, what the PJ Tour PIF deal would do for golfers. Clearly the competition with Live in the PJ Tour has up the purses, increased, you know, people's paychecks by however many millions we want to, you know, define it as and you know, very clearly has helped the players. So you know, you can see why the DOJ would have a big problem with them coming together and acting as one entity. Um, and then, and and that's kind of just the highest level of it. It trickles down, like the vendors could be impacted for tournaments per se, if there is a joint schedule and there's only one body um, asking for, you know, whatever, whatever is required to set up a golf tournament. And then there's maybe the TV networks or um, so there are so many different 
possible you know entities or people that could be impacted by this the at you know we as golf fans obviously want to see the best players in the world playing on the same stages but that's not really what the department of justice cares about at this moment yeah i was thinking about this is like who could this be worse for who you mm-hmm. know c- conceivably like they're you know at the high level of the game at the the top players i think they they lose a little leverage right yeah there's immediate they lose a little bit of leverage, but a unification you could argue is better for them. Where I kind of like started to center around is young players and developmental t- tours. Like there could very well, if the if the two tours remain separated, be this war to get the best feeder tour into Live or the PGA Tour, where you know, purses could go up in, in developmental tours. And like a great example of this, I think, is Caleb Surratt. Caleb Surratt it was a collegiate golfer. He was a very good collegiate golfer, not by any means the best collegiate golfer. He wasn't ranked number one in PGA Tour U. He was a couple years away from potentially getting a PGA Tour U exemption. But because of this split in, in pro golf, he garnered a multi million dollar multi-year deal to play professional golf and has substantially more money in his bank account than if 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 he had come around five or six years ago and he would have been duking it out on the PGA Tour of Americas or the Corn Ferry Tour for years before he had a chance at this millions of dollars. So that's like an example at the low level or let me not low level, but the mid level of how this competition for talent is good for labor. And if you unify the game, it could be worse for labor. Yeah, 100%. That's a really good example. It trickles down so far. And in the conversations with the experts that I had, they mentioned that in the process where the deal is going to be actually in the official review process with the DOJ, and we don't know if that's actually happening yet or not. But people like Caleb could be asked to come in and do an interview with the DOJ about how this, you know, would have negatively impacted him or um, it's very clear that they're going to do everything in their power to figure out like what the actual impacts of this thing would be. And it's not just the executives of the PGA tour and the, the PIF, you know, governors that are going to be asked to hand over information and talk to the department of justice. They're really going to spread their reach and figure out the impacts of this whole thing. So we're, uh, we're about a week away from the election when this is going to be aired. Um, <laughs> every, I'm ready for it to be over. I, I've, I've kind of done on the political <laughs> ads. Um, but in terms of uh, obviously the DOJ, uh, the, the Biden administration, has kind of been they've been working in tandem Ka- Kamala Harris is is you know I get a part of the Biden administration now and what is the general belief of how the DOJ would act with a Harris election Yeah the general belief and again like for for the, I wrote this in the story but I I reached out to both campaigns neither responded for comment I'm surprised um, I'm surprised yeah, they really didn't. surprising <laughs> the Department of Justice also gave us a no comment <laughs> I, um, you know, with how much <laughs> golf's been involved in this election, you know, yeah, going back well, to the Biden Trump debate and yeah, you know recent that. recent Trump remarks, but you know he's bringing golf in. I feel like golf's had a moment in the election season. It really has the Bryson video with Trump. Yes. That was the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I mean, th- no, obviously this isn't something that the campaign that either the Trump or Harris um, campaigns are, are running on. I was more kind of exploring it as a topic of, you know, the potential impacts that this this could have and um, very inadvertent, but also it direct in some ways, because for Harris, I the experts that I spoke to all kind of agreed that she would continue um, kind of the prosecutorial priorities that um, Biden has taken on in his administration, which is kind of empowerment of workers, labor markets, protecting protecting those labor markets, which very much um, seems to align with what we were discussing earlier with the with the competition of the author's labor and that whole kind of precedent. So I'm, sh- I'm sure that some listeners are rolling their eyes about the protection, <laughs> you know, the protection of the, the PGA Tour stars. Yeah, it, it's a it's totally. Uh, that was mentioned again in, in multiple of my conversations. Like, 
obviously these golfers are well paid and they're extremely well off and they live very comfortable lives. But the, again, like the Department of Justice doesn't care about that. It's simply the concept of limiting competition. Yeah. Um, which it's a crazy thing to think about because it's like, why would we care about these guys? But um, it, it helps them basically carry out like their mission and their, um, you well, know, goal I, for that I mean, economy. It's, yeah. it's absolutely true. I mean, it was effectively for, for decades, a single, like single pathway. Yeah. Yeah. And we saw like when competition entered and it was irrational money with competition, but what happened? Like the way these, these, players have been paid has been exponentially higher because right. competition you know the competition enters and the the de facto tour all of a sudden has to increase the wages it, it's a you know like from a golf fan standpoint i think you want the unification of the game and i think like an interesting aspect of this whole story and the doj is like sure the workforce is being rewarded but if by the workforce being protected, it kills fandom mm. and kills fandom, you then detrimentally like it, like you could completely kill the salaries in the long run because right. fans have discre decreased to such a like fandom has died. Right. Like the workforce and their compensation is directly tied to you know, fan interest and fan support. And it feels like golf right now is at a, a really, you know, kind of um, pivotal moment in, in its, you know, future. Mm -hmm, definitely. And like the TV contracts with NBC and ESPN all expire, I think in 2030. So mm -hmm. who knows like what the renegotiation of those deals would look like if fandom and golf is decreased by however, you know, what, what per, whatever percentage it might be. Also with labor, right. with labor, the, the clauses in those contracts about um, field strength, mm -hmm. that's like another, like, do these TV contracts start to try and ask for money back if totally. the fields get to a certain state, which like cuts against the idea of the labor, you know, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a, this is it, your, your story. This is why I wanted to talk with you. Your story <laughs> got me thinking in a lot of different ways about this whole conundrum, but like from a pure black and white standpoint, the labor market is greatly um, in, a, in a, in a far better place when there is competition. Yeah. A hundred percent. I agree. I, I think uh, another thing that might be missing from the whole discussion is by investigating this deal, they the Saudis will inevitably have to go through some sort of discovery process. And I don't think there is much sympathy for the Saudis on either side of the aisle right now in American politics. <laughs> um, and that's another huge, huge roadblock. I kind of like slipped that in at the end of my story. But I personally think that that's going to be a bigger issue than maybe anything we've discussed. You know, we saw how they tried to kind of evade the um, litigation and the discovery process in that whole thing that happened before the merger even was announced. Um, when I think they brought it to like the ninth circuit at some point, mm -hmm. and there they actually ruled that um, the, the Saudis were not qualified under like a foreign agency in this case, and since they were involved in an American um, commercial entity, so it's it's all it's also it's it's all really such a mess <laughs> so on the flip side so it, you know the general belief is harris would uh, yes. would continue kind of the path that we're on mm -hmm. right now with the doj very much kind of in the weeds and and looking at this from a labor standpoint what's yeah. the general speculation around what a, a trump presidency could bring yeah, I mean, bringing up Trump with all of these attorneys was just like, you know, he, <laughs> they basically are like, there's no, you know, telling what he would do. But in the past, and history has shown this, Trump uses the law to benefit himself and his companions. Um, and anything that could bring him success or could advance his personal interests, they would not put it past him to meddle with the DOJ and be more hands-on in this than any president might have been ever <laughs> just to kind of get what he wants. And so I, I kind of explained in, in the story, like even before the merger was announced, he told, 
he tweeted to golfers to take the money while they can because you know eventually the two bodies will come together and you'll get nothing if you if you don't um so clearly he was in some sort of cahoots then and i just imagine you know i i just think that and a lot of the the people that i spoke to thought the exact same thing is that he's he's different than any other president to predict you know what would happen in this scenario um but it's pretty easy to see the path of how he would act um, if if he becomes president and if this deal is still at a standstill in the future. I think there have been a lot of presidents that have loved the game of golf. They've mm -hmm. been notorious golfers. I don't think there's ever been a president or, or even a candidate for that matter that's d as deeply intertwined into golf as President Trump is um, between the golf courses he owned, um, to the, like, you know, I, I think more pictures with professional golfers have been taken with, uh, president Trump than almost like any, or, you know, former right. president Trump than any, any other, uh, president with a, you know, maybe Obama and NBA players would rival it. Um, but like, you know, when you think about his, he, he clearly has a deep passion for the game, but he also has a deep business interest for the game. I'm curious, you know, like, is his business, you know, because the tour distanced itself from Trump properties a few years ago, mm -hmm. um, is his is his business interest actually superior with Live Golf and them hosting tournaments at Trump properties, or is it actually with a merger happening and the PGA Tour being mm. back in into a position where they're selecting venues and such? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think that just all depends on the scope of the deal and what ultimately comes out of the negotiations, because I feel like there could easily be a agreement made where both the PGA tour and live continue operating um, separately. And maybe there's some crossover. There's so much speculation right now on what it could mean, but I think that uh, Trump involvement in any sort of deal in golf and seeing its success, whichever way that it's shaped, he would be all for that. In, in my opinion. Um, and that's just, and that's just me speculating and, and saying what I think. And, you know, based on all the interviews that I've done, we don't know what he's going to do. We don't know if he's going to get involved, but I, I see what you're saying and that he might want to live to kind of outshine the PGA tour and continue and not, you know, fall into this endless pit of spending that it is kind of right now, but I can just see him in general wanting, you know, some sort of stake or some kind of seat at the table. And as long as he's involved with the eventual deal, I feel like that'll serve his interests. I imagine there's there's probably a, a nice like position to be in saying, like, look at the game of golf, look what it was, and I was able to bring it all together. Make you golf know? great again. <laughs> yeah. I shouldn't have even said that. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's it's a fascinating little uh there's a lot more important stakes uh with the election yes, and yes. a lot more important topics, but I would say that this is a fascinating undercard to yeah. the presidential election. That's why that's what I was that's what I was going for. So thank you for taking that away from Andy. Please do not vote for either candidate based on what you want to happen in golf. I yeah. really would strongly advise against that. <laughs> this was not meant to be a this is what's gonna happen. If so and so or so and so is elected. It's no, just an please, interesting wrinkle. Yeah. There are much yeah. more important uh <laughs> things uh, at at the uh at the table than uh what happens with pro golf. Precisely. Um, but it, depending on what you what you're rooting for, there could be you know implications on on either side of the table. Um, yes, exactly. What else are What else are you working on at, at the Athletic? I've I I gotta say I've I've really enjoyed uh, your coverage over there Thank since uh, going over there this year. Congratulations! You've uh, you've really I think uh, t done some really nice pieces of work. What What can we expect from you as the uh, as the off season continues to roll on in the future? Yeah, great question. I'm kind of we're kind of in like brainstorming mode right now. So there there isn't anything in particular I'm chasing right now. I, I honestly am going to keep pursuing kind of the stuff on the deal and the Saudis. And there's kind of a whole other lens that we didn't even touch on, which is 
the human rights, sports washing, the, you know, Senate subcommittee investigation, which is still ongoing. So, you know, don't forget about that one. <laughs> and I mean, that um, was one of golf's greatest moments was yeah. that subcommittee uh, hearing. <laughs> it was so ridiculous. I know. I know. Yeah, there are no updates from that since February. So we're kind of waiting, waiting on that one. And I'm going to keep a close eye. But thank you for the kind words. I've, I've enjoyed my time at the athletics specifically because I, you know, I have the time and the resources to invest in these kind of longer term ideas. Um, one I really liked working on this past year and hope to continue, um, you know, in, getting into the weeds and, and this topic. It's a fun one is YouTube golf and and that whole world. I know you guys love to talk about the YouTubers. And I think they're just incredibly impactful in in like the quirkiest of ways. But I think we're gonna see a lot more of the kind of creator classic experiments next year. So I wouldn't um I wouldn't expect that to go away anytime soon. And I'm definitely gonna keep a close I mean, eye on all that. I think like it's it's crazy like the uh, like Bryson with with Trump a, yeah. in the vein of this story right Bryson. like I mean you look at, you're starting to look at Bryson's YouTube numbers and I mean YouTube's a representation of 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 reach in a certain demographic and a younger demographic and and you start to look at the numbers and it's like is Bryson potentially more powerful with a large percentage of the population in America that likes golf than the PGA tour. And, and it's becoming yeah. like, maybe yes. Like, and I think like, I think like something that everybody needs to understand also with YouTube golf is that like people's tastes and interests change as they age and the way mm -hmm. they consume stuff changes. Like someone who might be into Bryson right now might not be into Bryson in six years from now. Um, True. but, but there is like a huge, huge influence. And, um, I think like it's something to look at. Like I, a question I have is like, what would golf look like? Um, and how we, we talk about, you know, displaying golf if, if live, live betting didn't exist. Mm. Right. Really interesting. Yeah. Because I think you'd have a lot more golf just put up on YouTube produced, but betting is this huge multi-billion dollar industry that, totally. you know, right? It's yeah. like, well, you have to be able to bet on it, right? Like this match with Rory and Scotty and Brooks and Bryson in a couple of weeks, like there's yeah. no reason for this to be on live TV. It's, a, it's an objectively <laughs> offensive TV product when you, yeah. you're watching it and it's like, wait, I've been watching this for six hours. That's definitely what's going to happen too. Yeah. By the way. <laughs> no, yeah. I think that's an interesting point to raise. Cause like the, the YouTube golf realm, I feel like a lot of, at least the YouTubers that I talked to for that piece that I did earlier this summer was they target their content and, and, um, you know, ideas for videos to a younger audience, um, probably one that isn't even, you know, can't even bet legally. <laughs> like it's, it's teenagers, um, like the Brian brothers and Grant Horvat said they like specifically try, you know, not to use profanity or say anything inappropriate in their videos. They want it to be something that like they're, um, a 12 year old can turn on in the living room and their parents won't get mad at what they're watching. It's, it's really unique though, that that generation is leaning so much more towards like produced edited content, like you said. And I think it's honestly because there's more choice involved. Like you can pick which creators align with whatever sort of entertainment you like, and you don't have to sit through commercials. You don't have to sit through the broadcasters, you know, like monotone voices <laughs> drowning, you know, putting you to sleep. It's, you can fast forward videos, you can watch little snippets. There's like, in this generation, and I feel like I can kind of relate to this as on the cusp of, of you're, Gen you're Z. Bridging, yeah. You're bridging the gap. I'm like, I'm like right in, in the middle, but more towards Gen Z, and I watch way too much TikTok. But um, <laughs> it, it, it is, it's appealing to be able to choose what you want to watch. It's not like, you know, when I, talking to my dad, it's like I turn on the TV and whatever was on, I'm watching. It's, it's you have a whole world of content available to you out there. <laughs> That's something we've been talking to my our, our four year old about. I have a four year old <laughs> daughter and and she's like, we'll get in the car and she's like, she yells at me to put on Disney music. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, I didn't even get a choice. Like right. it was whatever That's was what on the radio. Says. That's yeah. what my dad says. He's like, if we were watching the Yankees, I was watching the Yankees. Like, yeah. Well, it's yeah. like a crazy thing. Like, right. Uh -huh. Like you just like, 
I, I think about it. It's like, you know, the on demand nature of it. I think it, it goes down to also like what you hit on. And I hadn't really thought about this is like when you turn on a broadcast, like, you know, the kid might be a fan of, of uh, Scotty Scheffler. It doesn't mean you're just getting Scotty Scheffler. And that's what YouTube yeah. offers. YouTube yeah, exactly. offers you. I'm going to turn this on. I'm going to watch the Bryan brothers totally. and like whoever they bring into my life. Versus like a, a PGA tour broadcast, you turn it on and it's like, well, I can't, I might, I might see five shots of my favorite player. Right. Exactly. There's like such, there's, there's a whole world of options available to kids. And it it's interesting because it, it, you know, this is a broader um, discussion, but like young kids have such separate interests and identities from their parents. Now, I think because of internet culture and like being able to develop these niche, you know, groups or like discussions on the internet or fandoms, like even in music. Um, like I feel like in my parents' generation, like it was he listened to what his dad or his mom was listening to in terms of music. And now it's like all these kids are finding these artists that no one has ever heard of who's older than 20 years old. Uh, it, it's kind of an interesting parallel to sports media because it's like, if if I'm, for example, like if I'm a diehard Colin Morikawa fan and he's not really playing super well in the PGA Tour event that's happening right now, he just made an hour and a half long video with Grant Horvat and I could just go turn that on instead. Well, it makes you think that the tour has to get the point to the point where I can customize my broadcast. Yeah. Like yep. that has to be where this all goes. Mm -hmm. And it has to be, I'm going to be able to watch all the shots from my favorite players like it's you know and you can start to see it with like the app and favorites but it has yeah. to get to the point you know in 10 years in the next 10 years where it may be sooner than that it probably really should get there in the next five years if they want their product to really be in ahead to where i could like turn on the television or open the app and i can watch every shot of my favorite my favorites list in a concise Easy. Like one of my favorite things that some majors do is they do that oh. like every shot from so and so's round. Yeah, love in those three minutes, yep. and it's mm -hmm. like, oh my god! Like I just like I know exactly how to talk. Like, and I use it for my job. I know exactly mm -hmm. like what shots were good, how how the context of the sixty seven rather right. than like just the number on the board. And if I saw a couple shots on the telecast, yeah. Totally agree with you. I think, I mean, one idea that like, I feel like I've talked to some people about is that we have, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of every PJ tour week. And right now that they, they occasionally invite like a YouTuber or influencer to come play in a pro-am and they're not allowed to film anything because it violates intellectual property laws, the media rights agreements. And if the tour could somehow like reshape those regulations, I think it would be so valuable for every week, just see who puts their hand up to go play an 18 hole match with fat Perez or whoever, and they could film a video and they could put it on the PGA tours, YouTube channel. And maybe they can do that right now, but they're not doing it. Um, and I know for a fact that YouTubers have, have been at PJ tour events and been told they can only make three minute long videos or something or whatever it is. Um, and well, I think there's so much opportunity there is what I'm saying that they that they just need to embrace that this idea is actually worth the time. <laughs> that's that's like a huge, uh, you know, to get back to like the discussion of of live in the mm -hmm. PGA Tour. Like another, I, you know, what we talked about was labor, like yeah. lives, lives, um, lives rights um mm -hmm. you know they don't really have a rights deal so <laughs> like <laughs> but what they've allowed bryson to do to yeah yeah with his youtube page that he would never have been able to do this with the pga tour and never. what they've what they've allowed bryson to do that's ex extraordinarily beneficial to labor once again this competition and what live offers you from a, a from what you can do as a player because you know i a few, I mean, like seven years ago, I met with some agencies in pro mm -hmm. golf and I talked about like the, how they should be building players, YouTube pages. Like you could see it because Kevin Durant was doing it in the NBA at this point, right. you know, seven years ago and all the agencies kind of like laughed at me. They thought it was like crazy. 
But now you see with Bryson the impact that it can have if a tool, if a player really invests in their page. And I think like it requires two things, personality and like on camera presence. Mm -hmm. And like, that's the thing that the, the YouTubers that have like done well, I think also like having like some golf skills are probably (laughs) somewhat required, but you know, think about like how many PGA tour players probably could have a, a flourishing YouTube page of their own, which when you talk about when you're done playing it at, it gives you more paths to being relevant for longer periods of time. 100%. Hundred percent. There are some. There are some players already kind of experimenting, even with like TikTok vlogs and um, who's who is Min it? Wu? Ben. Ben. Um, what's his last name? I'll, I'll think of it. No, not Ben. Cole. Ben Griffin. Ben Griffin has an amazing TikTok account. If anyone hasn't checked it out, he does like daily vlogs. Um, he shows like traveling to the tournaments, what the courtesy car looks like. You know, his range session, his goals for the day. It's awesome. I highly recommend. But I, what was I going to, I was going to say something earlier about, um, about Bryson. Oh, about impact. One of the things that I learned in reporting that YouTube story, there's this annual Dick's Sporting Goods Golf Galaxy commercial that comes out. And you might remember it was Phil Mickelson saying, you know, this promotion is available for the newest Callaway driver. And then the next year, I think it was Xander Shoffley. And then this year, it was the good, good guys. And mm-hmm. the commercial was literally just them in the parking lot of a Dick Sporting Goods. And they there's like a big billboard about the Father's Day promotion that they're running. And they like pretend to be celebrating a hole in one because the deal is so good. And it's literally like a 10 second commercial. And they're in their like polo shirts and short shorts and the whole thing. And that commercial was the most successful Dick Sporting Goods Father's Day promotion ever that they've ever had. It's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Well, it reaches all the 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 kids who are yeah. buying the Father's right. Day gifts. They right? they suddenly they look up on the TV and they pay attention. Those are the guys that I'm watching. I'm spending like the, the free hour of time that I have when I'm procrastinating my homework, watching Good Good, not you know, Bill Mickelson on the High Flyers. It was yeah. I I remember years ago, and this is like it's, I'm showing my age in the golf industry. I remember when Paige like kind of hit it big. Mm. I was speaking with someone who was who was like you know. They at first everybody was doing like women's products deals with Paige, and they weren't doing that well. And then and then somebody appro- like with men's products, and it just exploded. Like the marketing worked, <laughs> but it's like you know, like good good. You wouldn't think like oh like I'm a father. I'm not necessarily like a good good consumer. I'll pop in and watch a video here and there. I'm like mm-hmm. general. I'm curiously interested in what they're doing from like a work standpoint. Right. But like who the consumer is, is like that kid who's watching Good Good is going to turn to his mom and be like, we have to go. Let's get him something. Yeah. We have to go here for <laughs> Father's Day gift for dad. It's like brilliant. that. Yeah, it is brilliant. It's yeah. uh, it's uh, all right. Well, I'm excited to uh, to for that uh, follow up. And uh, <laughs> thank you for your time. People can uh, follow you on X and Instagram. What's your what are your handles? It's just Gabby Herzig. Maybe one of them has like a dot in the middle or something. But <laughs> yes. And TikTok. They can follow you on, no, I'm not on TikTok. Don't follow me on TikTok. <laughs> don't I have some amateur blogs up there with my brother and that's all. <laughs> we, I made a one I've made one TikTok video in my life and it was <laughs> um it was a baby a baby announcement. So it was four ah, year, five years ago. We did exciting. the remember the flip the switch? Yes, you did that. Yeah, we did that. We acted like you know. The, yeah, we sh- we showed I'm, the. I'm bomb. gonna have to go look that up right now. Andy. I don't know if you're gonna be able to find me. I'm. I I don't even know. I don't even I know how to log you. back into my account. I gotta get back on TikTok. I'll figure it out. I promise. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that uh, people uh, should read your work at the Athletic. It's worth uh, subscribing. There's great Thank overall you. sports coverage. You could obviously do the New York Times All Access, which. You know, my wife just found out I had New York Times All Access. I've had it for like five years. <laughs> nice. Love and, to hear uh, it. She's like, wait, I could have been using these recipes all along. And I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they have really great recipes. Also, yeah. shout out to my fellow colleagues at The Athletic, um, Brendan Quinn, Brody Miller, my editor, Hugh Kellenberger. Um, the subscription is obviously worth it for all of our writing and everyone else at The Athletic. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. For all right. Time. 
Thanks, Gabby. We'll talk to you soon. Uh, look forward to seeing you uh, this spring out on the uh, PGA Tour circuit. Sounds somewhere. great. Thank you, Andy. Bye, guys. All right. Big thanks to Gabby for coming on. Uh, let's get over to Brentley Romine and talk about college golf. All right. I am joined by Golf Channel's Brentley Romine. Brentley, I'm excited to chat a little bit about college golf. We are, uh, we're in the midst of, of college golf. There's a lot going on there. Um, how has been, you know, obviously with it being college football season, there's a huge impact of this realignment. Is it really felt much in college golf or because of the kind of nature of these invitationals and different tournaments, the, the, the conferences are kind of moot? Well, first, uh, thanks for having me, Andy. And to, to answer your question as, as succinctly as possible is no, because college golf teams have already played all over the country against teams from all different conferences, mid-major, power five, now power four. We won't really see the effect until we get to the conference championships. And in a, in a sense, you'll add two great teams to the SEC in Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, you add some good programs to the Big Ten, Oregon, USC, uh, Stanford to the ACC. So that's when we'll really start seeing the effect of this realignment is when some of these Pac-12 teams start winning conference championships uh, on, in the Big Ten or in the ACC. And uh, I feel like Illinois, they've had their their stranglehold now on the Big Ten, especially on the men's side for the better part of a decade, a decade plus. Uh, this could be the year where uh, they get a little bit more run for their money. That's what I was going to say. I was going to ask, does the Big Ten still run through Illinois? I, I would say, yeah. So, we, so the, the four teams, what that added to the Big Ten were Oregon, USC, Washington, and UCLA. I'm drawing a UCLA. So on the men's side, UCLA is probably the most well-equipped to challenge them when you look at the top of their lineup with Omar Morales and Pablo Arreño. I would still say with Jackson Buchanan, uh, with Orion Voice, um, Max, you know, with big Max, with with, with mini Sep, uh, mini Tank, Max Herendine. I, I would still say Illinois is the favorite, but but UCLA is is, is right on their heels. I I think obviously the other huge um, discussion in college sports centers around NIL, and we're a few years into and I the NIL era. How has it? Uh, impacted college golf. What what is the yeah? I think like everybody is always wondering like what is the NIL market like for golf. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, I think there were a lot of pessimistic people a couple of years ago when I mean this is right about the time. I guess it would have been three years ago or two years ago, right about the time of the year where all this stuff first came out. Um, and all these states were passing legislation and so on and so forth. And I think there were a lot of people who immediately dismissed NIL as not being ha having any sort of effect on on the non-revenue sports. Um, you know, in, in our case with golf, they're like, oh, well, like how many golfers are really going to be millionaires? And I think now that we've had a couple years into this and, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll discuss how it's all getting ready to you know, be flipped on its head again. but um, th there aren't millionaires in college golf right now still, uh, but there are a handful of players who are pulling in uh, six figures a year. Um, you know, I, I think in the research that I've done, um, the Ludwig Abergs, the Gordon Sargents, like these guys are pulling in over 100K a year in, in, in NIL. And on the women's side, um, though no one really knows for sure, I, I think in the span of her college career, the two years that she spent at Stanford, Rosang was right around a half million dollars. Now, uh, I'm not sure how much of that was, um, you know, kind of took into account uh, early stages of pro careers, like how deals have kind of moved on uh, from when she was in college. But I mean, still a half million dollars. Um, sorry, I have a fly flying uh, in front of me right now. But uh, a half million dollars for the best woman's college player perhaps ever. Um, that's a pretty good chunk of change. And I think as you go down the, you know, down the tiers in terms of 
uh, talent of, of player and marketability of player, the average, you know, let's just say the average three man on a, on a power five team is probably looking at somewhere in the 20s to 30s um, with some of the second team All-Americans probably around that 50 to, to, to 60K per year mark. It's better than Poca and I, you know. Um, I will say, you know, I, I had heard that Amari Avery, for example, the standout at USC, had a monster NIL deal. I think, like, I think the big deals, kind of, from what I've heard, kind of center around talent and also marketability. Um, yeah. Your Gordon Sargent, for example, is at the top of of the earning side. And obviously, he got a huge boost his freshman year when he was playing in the Masters, you know, mm-hmm. and the commentary and the buzz around that, I think, has has propelled him to a to a huge level. Um, you know, recently, I had I had heard a rumor of a of someone that transferred from power five to power five and, you know, is is playing three or four on his new team and is pulling in a six figure deal. You know, it's it's been an it's an interesting dynamic um you know i think like how does it work on the recruiting basis as we're starting to see like the next wave of kids like and how is it impacted how's nil impacted just recruiting in general well it's it's funny you say that because there is a, a a highly sought after prospect right now uh in junior golf that um i think teams are are trying to line the brinks uh you know back the brinks truck up to and uh, trying to outbid some, some other schools for. But a, as far as that rumor, like six figures for a three man on a power five, I, I think some of that is uh, you know, maybe a little rub of the green in, in terms of teams trying to not trick, but um, maybe motivate uh, their competitors to spend more and more um, when they don't have to. Uh, I, I would highly doubt that that there's a three man on on any program in the country uh, pulling in over a hundred thousand dollars. Now, it's golf is interesting in the fact that this nil money is is coming from a bunch of different avenues. Like golf is fairly unique in the sense that the OEMs like Titleist and TaylorMade, um, you don't have too much of that in in other sports. Like you have, I, I guess, the equivalent of that would be a shoe deal in football or or, or basketball, but like these guys like Spalding is not, is not paying basketball players NIL. I, I don't even know what ball they use. They use a Nike ball in, in uh, NCAA right now. So I'm I don't think sure. Nike is. It's like... Yeah. So, but like the equipment these guys are using, uh, maybe lacrosse is, is another parallel. Maybe the type of sticks like Epic lacrosse sticks, or I don't even know the different brands of, of lacrosse, but um, golf is so unique in that you have that you have um, the like boosters. you mentioned them. You mentioned, nice. well, the boosters and the collective. One of the cool things or most interesting things, I'm not sure how cool it is, but Florida State, for instance, has two collectives. Um, I think it's like Unconquered and the Battle's End. I could have gotten each of those wrong, but one of them is definitely the Battle's End. And there's one specific collective that is just for football and golf. And the other ones are for every other sport, you know, plus football and golf. So, um like money's coming from there. And then you also have like in Amari Avery's case, you have the bank of America deal that she had around the Augusta national women's amateur. So um, all that kind of piles in, into a big pot. So that's where, you know, a two man or something is getting 60 K or 70 K cause they're kind of getting it from a bunch of different buckets. And to add on your Amari Avery comment real quick, there was a point in 2022 where she was the, uh, she was number two in NIL at USC behind Caleb Williams. So that's crazy. Uh, and and I think Juju was was a freshman at that point, um, and she was a close number three. I think eventually she passed Amari, but that's pretty good to be only behind the quarterback for a snapshot in time at, at your school. That shows that golf is not this afterthought that people thought it would be. I think golf presents for the collectives and it's a little bit different, right? Where like someone who's obviously it's like very attractive to highly affluent people are are generally golf are playing golf and, and probably some of the biggest donors and, and the collectives are golfers. And the other thing that golf presents is unlike other sports, 
if I if I'm a, a donor and I give you know five hundred thousand dollars into collective, I'm not putting the pads on and going going getting in the trenches with the D line prospect we're buying. I could, however, you know, go play around a golf with the person that we support in the NIL, and I think that's probably one of the huge advantages that golf has over maybe some other non revenue sports is that there is the ability to gain other benefits besides like the pride of having a great team. Oh, like I could go, you know, this, this person could give me a lesson or we could play nine holes. Like, like that is, that is a unique proposition. Um, I have to imagine like I, and I don't, this is just, I was thinking about this today before this conversation. Are there multiple recruiting strategies where, you know, some people are paying for the NIL. I think like college golf is a huge step up from high school golf. It is a huge... And I think like one of the things is a little bit more of a crapshoot. And one of the reasons it's a crapshoot is because like it is a big step up in golf courses. You don't know how, you know, certain players are going to adapt to a completely different environment when where they're away from their home. They're in this new environment. They're playing new golf courses that are much more demanding. Is are there multiple strategies of are there schools that are saying we'll pay the NIL bucks, but we're going to go into the transfer market and find the kids that maybe were ranked 150th in their class and ended up being you know a top 20 player versus like hey instead of just dropping you know dropping the bag on this high school kid we think we can find more value in the transfer market has there been a lot of strategies which ones have you seen have been the best. Um, you know, examples of, of different strategies. So as with anything with the sport uh, that I've come to learn over the 12 or 13 years plus I've been covering it is it, there's a comp, there's a complex answer to that, Andy. And that I think the last couple of years when we still had the extra year because of the pandemic, it, the, the transfer portal had a lot more uh, like high level talent to so where some players in there, what, you know, should, should, and could demand you know, a significant amount of NIL. I think now that we've gotten past that, like the transfer portal has dried up in a sense to where it's not as big of a strategy as it may have been the last handful of years. Um, so, but but again, like that's getting ready to change too because with these roster caps coming, uh, the transfer portal next May, as soon as the selection show um, on our air is done for for the men and for the women, that portal is going to heat up. There's going to be players at the back end of all these power five schools that, that are suddenly going to be probably destined for more mid-major golf. And uh, I think at that point, uh, then the cycle kind of gets back to, all right, like some of our collective money, some of our NIL money should go to the portal. Um, but I think at least for this recruiting cycle, and then once we get a couple years out of these, of these roster cuts, it, it's going to go back to... Um, trying to make smart investments and hit the recruiting trail, um, hit, hit the international market, um, try to figure out like what kids are. And it's going to be how it always has been like predict what kids can make that jump. And the crazy thing is you mentioned the a big jump between high school golf and college golf. A lot of the top junior players don't even play for their high school teams, which is something I think a lot of people don't realize. Um, and well, it I, hurts I don't their know wagger. How, it could hurt their wagger, right? Well, and, and, and some people it's would ridiculous. argue that that, that wagger that wagger is, or or as Brendan likes to call it, wagger. Um, <laughs> some people would argue that that's getting less and less important, especially as it relates to PGA Tour U, um, and that being the pathway to some sort of status. Because whereas before, if you were top ten in wagger, that was kind of uh, one of the top benchmarks that agents and OEMs and people looked at when coming up with how much you were going to get paid with your first contracts out of amateur golf. And now it's the, the really the only, the only bonus I can see with Wagger is qualifying for the USAM, um, whether that be on the women's or the men's side, which a lot of the elite women don't even play the women's AM, but that's a, that's an argue, or that's a conversation for another day um, or making a Walker cup team. Like those are really the only reasons that i could see wagger really mattering and then you could be number one the mccormick medal obviously but that's only an opportunity that a handful of guys have but 
kind of across the board, like it, it, you're, you should be worrying less and less about Wagger uh, and more and more just about playing in, you know, tournaments and, and, and getting in front of uh, coaches and playing the best courses and against the best fields that you can and, and that you can afford. Um, and, you know, coaches will, will find you. And um, I, again, like I'm not, I'm not super worried about these college coaches because they've proven that they know where to recruit, what, you know, what countries, different schools have their, their different pipelines. Uh, Mike Small, obviously in Illinois has got the Belgian pipeline. Um, Oregon's starting to get the, on the women's side, a pipeline out of Taiwan. Um, the same for Laura at, at Texas, you know, at Arizona, she brought in a lot of players from, from Asia. Um, so I, I'm not worried about these college coaches. Like they'll, they'll figure out, um, you know, how to identify the talent and then they'll, they'll use what, you know, what NIL money they, that they have wisely. And, and I think that's kind of up in the air now, right. With this, uh, salary cap that's, that's coming that no one really knows for sure how that's going to affect, uh, these college golf programs. You've alluded to it. what what are the high level kind of changes coming to to college golf? What how is it going to be different? Uh, I would say that we're in this uh, wild wild west period. Yeah, like right now, it's really the wild wild west because teams can spend as much money as they want to, and a lot of these deals, a lot of these nil deals, and and we've seen it on the football side. Like some of these deals have been kind of kind of shady and. And I think people have been taking advantage, uh, whether it's some agents or, um, you know, what have you, lawyers, um, with all this litigation that that's going around. Um, like one coach said it to me best, like the only two people who are making a lot of money right now, besides the athletes, are lawyers and agents. So what incentive do they have to come up with a solution um, that would potentially, you know, cut them out of some money in the future. Um, so right now it's the wild, wild west. I think with the NCAA back in May, when they announced that they were coming to some sort of uh, $2.8 billion agreement where it would settle the three biggest um, lawsuits that are on the table, it would settle those. And, and essentially um, it would earmark some money for past athletes, but then it would create uh, what's essentially a salary cap uh for college uh, athletic departments. And that would be basically in layman's terms, you could um, revenue share um, up to 22% uh, of the athletic department's total revenue, which obviously a lot of that's coming from the revenue uh, produced uh, you know, via football, basketball, um, whatever media rights contracts, things of that nature. So you can share up to 22%. So for a big time program, you're looking at between 20, 21, up to maybe $23 million right now. Um, that'll be divvied up however the department see fit. Now, the big question I mean, is... That's, that's crazy because some college basketball or football programs right now are exceeding that much in their spend. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, think like, so, I think UConn last year was like $23 million alone in basketball spend. Yeah, which... Uh, th there's going to be other lawsuits down the line. Um, but I, I think this is, it, it's a step in the right direction because it, it's going to give, um, you know, some mid majors potentially a chance. And, and I'm just looking at it definitely through a, a golf lens and that not only are the mid majors going to be getting potentially better players because you're cutting down rosters from, I would say like in this summer, uh, John Rehorn, who's the men's uh, golf coach at Oregon State, he went through all the Power Five men's rosters, and he was under the assumption that it would be a roster cut to nine, which was initially announced. But now there's some rumblings that it might be eight. Well, with the nine, with roster cuts to nine, there would there would be 65 men's golfers um, who would need to find another place to play. So those players will probably matriculate down to mid major, and then when you think about the fact that this 22 million or 22 percent um it's all going to go to the the football players and the basketball players it's not going to necessarily go to the golfers now a program like pepperdine that doesn't have football that could put them in a position to say all right we want to go all in on golf so you're you're kind of given the school th its own agency to pick its winners and losers right That's like you're you're just you're deciding what what teams you want to be great and what teams you don't want to be great. And the major, vast majority are going to pick football. Um, but some teams might like earmark a little bit 
for that golf. But I, I think the other thing, and it's still up in the air, just like what happens to, to the collectives at this point, from my understanding is there's going to be this third party arbiter. Um, so there's some rumblings that could be like Price Waterhouse Cooper or something of it, but it's going to be someone who's like a referee that's going to be able to determine, all right, like this NIL deal, is it legit? Like, is it is it fair market value for this particular athlete? Or is it just a roundabout way for a school to pay to funnel money to its players? If they determine the latter, then that will count towards your 22%. Um, if it's an NIL deal that's completely organic, you know, like Titleist wants to pay Gordon Sargent, um, like that won't count toward that. And you're going to get unlimited scholarships now, but are all eight players going to be on full rides? Probably not. But that scholarship money will, will not count toward your 22%. So there, again, I'm throwing a lot of information out there, but some of it's still to be determined. But I think the gist of it is you're going to have a salary cap. Almost none of it's going to go to golf. Um, unless and, unless the school wants to be a great correct. golf school in which they, they could, could be. They could and it wouldn't take... One. It wouldn't take that much either. It wouldn't take that much money. Um, I think that's where you hit on this earlier, but the equipment manufacturers um, relationship in this is, is huge because if a school has a good relationship with a Callaway or a Titleist or a TaylorMade, that seems to me what you just said about the NIL and the arbiter deciding if it was a legit deal it is like you coming to them and saying, hey, Let's, we have this 100K deal from Callaway for, our, for three of our top 100 players. It would be probably hard for an arbiter to say this is not a legitimate NIL deal. Like this equipment company has a vested long-term interest in building a relationship with, this, with said athlete because if they make it to the PGA Tour, they want them to be sponsored. It's a fascinating aspect. I wonder... You know, when you think about it and, you know, this is I, you know, I didn't know all the intricacies of this going in, but like that would make a lot of sense if I'm an equipment company and also a university that I want to build really good relationships with the equipment manufacturers. Yeah, there, there's a fine line to walk, of course, because otherwise you could see, you know, some programs getting into a situation with Adidas and, and, and Auburn and some of the basketball schools. Um, but it's it's interesting how the OEMs have kind of evolved and and what they've decided to invest when it comes to college golf. Like for a while there, um, I don't know if you remember, this was probably six or seven years ago, but PXG announced that they were sponsoring like five college programs. It was like Oklahoma, Vanderbilt, I forget who, Oregon might've been one of them, but it was like this big push. And it was right around, it was right around like 2017, 2018, like right around the time, like OU won at Rich Harvest Farms, um, Oregon was really good. Vanderbilt was in its prime, but I, I don't think they necessarily got the return that they thought they would. Um, and so now I, I really think the OEMs have been fairly conservative on what amateurs they're, you know, providing more than just product to. Um, and, and I think you're seeing that like Rose Zhang, um, with Callaway, Gordon Sargent with Titleist, uh, Luke Clanton, TaylorMade. Um, it basically stops there just in terms of like significant money, because why, why is an OEM going to risk, um, giving money to a, a college kid who, who might get stuck with PGA tour U, it changes things a little bit, but who might get stuck in Q school and in purgatory for a couple of years, like that doesn't do them any good. They're better off picking guys off the corn Ferry tour or getting guys when they turn pro. Um, because you have to start, I mean, those NIL contracts don't carry over to the pros. So you have to sign a new deal and you can invest all this money in a guy when he's in college and then he turns pro and decides to sign with somebody else. So there's different OEMs probably have different philosophies. You know, like Cleveland Trixon has a different philosophy than TaylorMade and TaylorMade has a different philosophy than, than Titleist. Um, so it, it's... It, it's certainly interesting, but I, I don't, I don't see, um, you know, a, an, an OEM having such a great relationship with certain programs to, to, to where like program or like athletic departments can kind of circumvent uh, some of these rules by, you know, by getting Cal like, hey, come, come play for us. Like Callaway will then sign you to a 
hundred thousand dollar contract. I, I don't. I think the really good players will be getting that no matter where they go. PGA Tour U has been a massive change also in the college golf space. Um, I think like you know as a as recent as about four years ago, we saw the likes of Davis Riley, Will Zalatoris turning pro mid season and leaving um, to to kind of set up their best chances of getting a Corn Ferry Tour card, a PGA Tour card, thus with like a full calendar year. Now, with a guaranteed PGA Tour card at, at stake for the top spot and guaranteed Corn Ferry cards for the you know next five, or it's the next four spots, well, uh, it, it, yeah, it's next four and then conditional yeah, up to con- 10. Yeah. Conditional up to 10. It has opened up a, you know, it's almost created the opposite uh, impact where it's extremely advantageous to stay in college. Um, how has the PGA Tour U expansion um, impacted college golf and, and amateur golf? And where, where do you think? Um, it's going to go. Do you think it will continue to expand? Do you think there will be more cards uh, handed out in the near future because of the success? I mean, like the crazy thing has been the success of the players. Um, They have almost like to almost all of them have hit the ground running and proved out that they are deserving of these cards. Yeah, I don't know. But like people have thrown out the idea of more PGA Tour card, especially with what Ludwig's done, like Michael Thorpe Bjornsson's showed out. Like if you finish number one in this, um, you know, chances are, at least with the small sample size, that you're going to be great and you're going to, you know, have a long career on tour. But I, I'd be a little leery just in terms of who's making the decisions, right? I mean, Jordan Spieth uh, had to go through Q school and didn't didn't get to final stage his first try. Um, so you have these guys making decisions like what what incentive does Patrick Cantlay and, and I'm kind of asking you this as a question like what incentive does he have to allow two guys off, out of college golf every year to get their PGA Tour card in addition to the guys who would get it via this new accelerated program like none right well I think it's it's around I think like the long term the game's getting younger. And I think the tour should be deeply invested in building name brand recognition with younger players faster. Yeah. To me, if I were looking at it, I would give a card to the best senior. But at this point, I think like it's becoming clear that some of these kids are ready to go at age twenty. Well, and and, I- and, and like we saw, Sergeant got the it had the ability to do that based off of earning certain amounts. I think that that should be a little bit more emphasis should be placed on like, okay, you know, like a great example would be like Joaquin Neiman a couple of years ago. Um, He ended up turning pro at 18 and immediately was a very top 100 player. Um, If he had gone to college for a year, he should have had the opportunity to earn a card through certain thresholds. Like if a top, top, top end talent goes to school and shows out their first year, they should be able to earn a card, in my opinion. You know, there should be that's that's the way I would be thinking about this if I were the tour. If I was thinking about like what incentive do I have as a policy board holder? I know that like I'm I have an I'm an equity holder in the tour now. The game's getting younger than ever. One of the issues with the game getting younger than ever is it, it is a sport that builds its superstars over decades. So how do we how do we accelerate the name recognition standpoint of these young players so that when they're 22, people know who they are? Luke Clanton's a great example mm-hmm. who played a slate of summer PGA Tour events and played exceptionally well. People know who Luke Clanton is now. And that's super like it's, you know, so that that's the thing that I um I mean, like Nick Dunlap is a great example of this. Like he he's ready to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, and that's why someone like Jaden Daniels and and Caleb Williams are as big a stars as they are already. One, because Jaden Daniels is playing some absolutely incredible football, but like we followed him and were exposed to him in in college, and and so I definitely think PJ Tour U plays a huge part in this because Luke Clanton, like the only reason he's really playing that many PGA tour events in the summer 
And having the opportunity to have three top tens is because of PGA Tour U and the accelerated and his ability to earn these points for every top 10 and, and, and every made cut he makes and every major he qualifies for. Um, and, and so I, I, I think there has to be a balance though, as we see on the women's side with LPGA Q school, um, where we're going to have, you know, one of the top players in women's golf, Zoe Campos from UCLA, she's going to leave her team mid season. And it kind of, uh, I mean, it doesn't kind of, it, it, it screws over her, her coach and and her team. And yet it's, it's, you have to look out for yourself, but at the same time, like this kind of leaving mid season, uh, is, is an example of a, a tour and a pathway to that tour. That's too far slanted toward the professional side of things. And so that, that's why I think PGA tour U has got the balance, right. And that you probably can't earn your PGA tour card that first year, but you could be working towards it. You could still be playing these PGA Tour events like we're seeing Coyvin play and Clanton and Ben James now to an extent. Um, and you could potentially, I think Jackson Coyvin and Clanton both have a chance now uh, at the end of this year to, to have a PGA Tour card and a decision to make next summer. And, and Coyvin will have played two years of college golf and Clanton three years. But um, I, I, I'm just, I'm very leery that they're going to open it up to more PGA Tour cards available. But I think even in the five years that we've had PGA Tour U, it's proven that if you do, if you were to hand out two PGA Tour cards, like there are players ready to take those that could be factors right away on the PGA Tour. Like I, I, I go back to, like I, I pulled up the very first PGA Tour U class and I'll just read it quickly. Like John Pock was number one. He just got his PGA Tour card this year through KFT. Davis mm-hmm. Thompson, winner on the PGA Tour. Austin Eckert, winner on the PGA Tour. Kevin Yu, winner on the PGA Tour. And then you get into the Garrett Reban, who's still in you know the developmental tours. Fiegels, Trevor Warbelow, Jonathan Brightwell. And then Quade Cummins, Mac Meisner. Those are two guys either about to be on the PGA Tour or has been on the PGA Tour. So you're talking about three PGA Tour winners off a class where none of those guys were got a PGA misses. Tour card right away. Yeah. What happens if they would have been out there from the get-go like that. If you handed out three PGA Tour cards and Davis Thompson and Austin Eckrow were out there in 2020, you know, 2021, summer of 21, uh, they may have, they could be in a conversation for President's Cup and, and, and Ryder Cup teams by now. Um, so th- there's an argument, I think, both ways. But, um, you know, certainly you can, there's a good argument to make that you could, you could offer more tour cards. I think, well, I think it also, like this is a, is where what does PGA Tour golf look like in two years? Is it a ultra elite elite tour? You know, mm-hmm. it could look the same. That's right. <laughs> I think we have a discussion earlier in this pod that talks a little bit about that. But um, the uh, you know the thing about it is like you could have an ultra elite tour, and then could could the you know. Typical week in week out PGA Tour be more of a PGA Tour like bottom half plus Corn Ferry top half that could facilitate more spots where you have a top end tour of eighty or seventy or sixty whatever it is guys and the play the play up and down is a little bit more the churn up and down is a little bit more frequent but you have that bigger pool at the bottom that facilitates more PGA tour cards for college players. And then the ability to quickly accelerate up. You know, I just think about like last year, you, you know, you gave Thor Bjornsson a card, you gave Ludwig a card. I mean, Ludwig was effectively playing on a PGA tour. U exemption Mm -hmm. last year. He quickly earned his place, but another college player came in and should have been at Eastlake with Ludwig. It was Nick Dunlap. The only reason he wasn't was they didn't count the points for his first win. Yeah. yeah. But like you effectively had two kids straight out of college that were top 30 players on the PGA Tour last year. This year you get Thor Bjornsson, who looks like a stud. You could have had, you know, could have been Gordon Sargent. He decided to come back for school. But another player that had like kind of a decision with Luke Clanton, who decided to go back to school. So like you have this this place where like I think you could have made an argument but that between Clanton, Dunlap and uh and Ludwig alone you had three of the top 50 players on the PJ Tour last year. Yeah. 
I mean, especially ball striking wise, I think it was Smarten that tweeted out where Clanton would would have ranked like off the tee and approach the green. Like he'd be a top five player, essentially tee to green, get rid of the short game part of it. And um, like, what, what's that strokes game ball striking? Yeah, um, he'd be like I always top. I always think that should be a, a stat like around the green doesn't make sense for T two green. You well, know, yeah, I and get that stat does exist. It's just not it's not featured prominently on the PGA Tour's um, website yeah, among the or among data the four standards. I, yeah, I, it's not on data golf. Well, I, no, used I think to have it a might be on data that golf. I used to work out of all the time that had just that combined, and it's like a way better um, barometer of of ball striking talent. I'm Around still a big green. total driving guy. Here's yeah, antiquated total. as it is, a total driving. I just played a lot of golf last week, and I gotta say, like it, total driving is like a good stat because, like, if you're hitting fairways and you're hitting a lot of drivers, like, <laughs> yeah, and you're hitting like it, it far, yeah, yeah, hitting it far and you're hitting it straight, like, it's a good stat to to monitor because, like, you just don't make big numbers when you're hitting the ball far and you're hitting fairways. Like your your floor is extraordinarily high, which is in seventy two hole stroke play. Like that's that's kind of like the name of the game there. Um, mm-hmm. Last thing before we get you out of here, um, tell me a little bit about the golf facilities race. It there have been some like shocking, shocking totals on on these these facilities that are being built. I saw the Alabama facility hundred million dollars. I just saw something about Vanderbilt. What what is going on with golf course uh, with uh, these college programs and their facilities? Well, I, I think it's a just another distinction, especially as we're getting to a a point where college golf is moving toward you know capping the amount that you can compensate these athletes. You have to distinguish yourself some other way, and I think this is very much the kind of the arms race we saw like a decade ago. Um, when you look at it, you know, a school like Illinois um, completing a, a new facility a, a couple of years ago, Indiana did something where they added a new golf course to or redid their golf course like six or seven years ago. Um, so, I mean, it's just uh, it's, some of this is just it is just nuts, right? O- Oklahoma is working on a new facility and, and, and I would, you know, I would stand to argue that they probably could have used a, a little bit of an upgrade before that. Um but like that's just one other way that they're going to have to distinguish themselves. But it was interesting because I had, I had Frankie Sappen on our college podcast, which he's not a college golfer, but he used to be, and now he's going to the PGA Tour. I think out of this crop of thirty uh, KFT grads this year, a lot of people might tab him as one of the two or three guys who probably has the best chance to to make it. Um, you know, and play Ryder Cups and win tournaments and win majors and all that. And it was interesting because he had kind of the the opposite path in college golf where he started out at, at Alabama and then he it didn't work out there for him and he transferred to Florida Gulf Coast. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if he was a big uh, Dunk City fan back in the day as a kid, <laughs> but, but he ended up at Florida Gulf Coast. And um, I, I know the coach there well, so he won't mind me saying this, like their facilities are not great like i don't know if you've heard of the old corkscrew uh golf club yeah. in Astero, florida but it's just a really hard golf course that i'm not sure um would make any top 50 lists in, in college golf and their facilities are essentially non-existent he, he he talked a lot on this podcast about how he feels like that was the that was the least important thing like it wasn't about where you were practicing and some coaches would disagree. Like I was just in Chapel Hill after the U S open and Andrew DiBetetto, the head coach was walking me around their, you know, short game area where they have all these different lies you can simulate and all of these different size greens that allow you to develop all this analytics and so on and so forth. And it just sounds a lot more complicated uh, than it, than it should be if we're just looking at like different heights of grass um, and holes in the ground. Um, but like Sappen said, but like that just doesn't matter at the end of the day. It's just all about like what what players are you surrounding yourself with that can help you get better, and then it's ultimately just you know playing tournaments and and getting and getting better that way. But he said it didn't it didn't matter whether he was at a 
multi-million dollar dollar facility at Alabama, which you know apparently when he was there, it, it wasn't good enough because they had to blow it all up, um, or playing at at old corkscrew on not as good surfaces and and things of that nature. I mean, it worked out pretty well for him. Like it worked out well for you know all these guys who played you know the majority of their college careers in mid-major golf. Like Vincent Norman played D two. Chris Goddard played at Rutgers for four years. That's essentially a mid-major in, in college golf sense. I mean, even a guy like Keegan Bradley at at St. John's. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't imagine St. John's facilities were that great, although they probably got to play some pretty cool courses uh, every now and then. But yeah, I just I, I don't think it's as big of a deal. And, and I think some of these programs and athletic departments are going to look back on are going to look back on these huge investments in their facilities and realize that. Yeah, like we probably didn't need the hundred million dollar facility with the lockers that open themselves and the bidets with every toilet and the the three chefs and uh, twenty ping pong tables. Like we probably didn't didn't need all that. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. I I just like you think about the spectrum of like, and I don't know exactly what Kent State's uh, facilities are. But there's three Kent State golfers that are pretty good PGA Tour players from the maybe, same team, maybe yeah. four. And the likelihood that you know you th- take back to when they were playing, they were probably just hitting balls into a net in the gym most winters, without like a TrackMan even. Like I imagine, like TrackMan are are big investments for some of these college programs. And I, yeah, Cal, it, I I mean, development is such an interesting. Um, topic and it's nonlinear. It's like people come from all different um, kind of backgrounds and at t- different times in their career become great players. And it's a, it's a fascinating, like, I think if I was running a, a college program, I would, I like when to our earlier discussion, I, when I was thinking about this, I think I would prioritize spending money later and getting kids that really perform at a lower level and bringing them up to mm-hmm. my to my level where we have better facilities because I know that person's going to be hungry. It's just an interesting it's a, I I think college golf is uh it's on the verge maybe of starting to have a little bit more of a moment in 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 a space in golf. It seems like Golf Channel your uh your employer has really prioritized it uh this fall and has been showing a lot more college golf which has been great to see. And I think there's there's just a um there's a huge opportunity, especially with the way that what that both men's and women's golf is, where it's really skewed younger to start to build some of these personalities at a younger age. Yeah, and, and college golf is is really set up, I think, for the future, especially when you look at this this college world golf championships foundation that John Fields and, and his daughter April are, are kind of heading. And, and I've spoken to Coach Fields a lot in the last like year or two about this subject and especially at a time where the NCAA is is going to be having to make cuts across the board um, to pay for all the for all these settlements and and those types of things like college golf to to be self-sustaining would be huge as it relates to the championships and I think the number to to run like both championships right like a PGA Tour level field said it's like Three million dollars a year for men's and women's, and so if if you could get that fully endowed year after year, um, and it wouldn't take that much from the top fifty players in the world every year to just donate a little bit of that money, like most of them played college golf, like just to give back just a little bit, and then all of a sudden that number is is very easy to achieve. So I think golf is set up in a great spot. And one last thing to kind of touch back on the facility talk, like there's a I almost feel like sometimes players can get too comfortable when they have everything that they need when everyone's and, and you hear players talk about this a lot, especially when they struggle right out, right out of the gates. The things that they, they talk about is, you know, I wasn't prepared for pro- professional golf because everything was done for me in college golf. And then when I turn pro, yes, I, you know, I might have an agency, but they're also responsible for a couple dozen other players. Like no one's holding my hand. I almost feel like it could be a detriment sometimes to have everything at the fingertips of these players um, because nothing, I mean, a hundred million dollar facility in Tuscaloosa isn't preparing you for staying in, in Hampton Inns and, and flying Frontier Airlines 
from PGA Tour America's event to PGA Tour America's event and then to a Monday qualifier. Maybe not a always a Hampton end. Could be worse than a Hampton. It could be. It, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, discredit any uh, value hotels that that may may or not be great um, and great to. I mean, clean bed, clean bathroom. That's my motto when it comes to uh, hotels. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a detriment. I think sometimes for these players to be coddled for four years and then they just get thrown out there and you know it's no it's no surprise that we see some of these players just they don't they don't make it or or they don't make it for a few years they get discouraged and then all of a sudden they have the yips or mentally they're just not in it they don't enjoy it anymore um so yeah i mean i i would just say be careful what you wish for uh, when it comes to kind of bolstering your your facilities and how much money you're actually you know pouring into that all right, Brentley, it was great chatting all about the business and the uh, kind of uh, ins and outs of college golf these days. People can read your great work at golfchannel.com. Actually, it's not golfchannel.com. Well, it's it still it's, redirects. It's a redirect, yeah. yeah. Well, it redirects. That's, that's <laughs> the way I find it, golfchannel.com. Um, also, follow you on, uh, on Twitter at BrentleyGC uh, mm-hmm. on Twitter. Twitter or also known as X these days. Lots of changes. I have I'm not up to them, you know. It's MVC I, I still Sports call it Twitter. And, uh, yeah, and Twitter. I still call it Twitter. And X. Golf Channel, so, Twitter. Um, all right. Thanks, Brentley. We'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Friday Golf Podcast. Uh Big thanks to PJ Clark for putting this together, editing and producing this uh, episode. And thank you to uh, Gabby and Brentley for coming on and and chatting. Um, We will be back Thursday with a new episode. Um, And in the meantime, if you haven't, check out Club TFE. We we produce a lot of good stuff in there. Um, We put actually our uh, part of our design notebook was in this week's newsletter to give you a little sample of what design notebooks like. So if you're a fried egg newsletter subscriber, go check that out. Almost all of the story was in there. You can see kind of what what that's like on a weekly basis. And uh, if you liked it, sign up. It's $120 for y- per year. And uh, it, go- it really supports what we do. And you get a lot of great content from it um, on top of uh, many other benefits. To join, go to thefriedegg.com slash membership. All right. Big thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you on Thursday.